Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might know the hope to which you have called me. Teach me, God, each day as we heard to trust you and I love you to lead us by hand. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who were in there last week, I would still encourage you to go back, log on to the website, church website, and listen to that message. But we'll continue, because we can't leave a verse like that which Jesus speaks. John chapter 4 and verse 34. John 4 and verse 34. And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. My food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Now you tell me, what is your and my meat or food? What's our food? Because your food, like we looked last week, will dis- determine your strength your direction, and your destiny. What is our food? Jesus said, my food is this, the word of God, the word of my Father. He says, this is my food. The first thing primary in my life is this, all my strength, my direction, my purpose, everything is shaped by this. Now the opposite of the word, if there is an opposite to the word, interestingly, in the Bible, would be what? The opposite of the word would be the world. You can either be led by the word or led by the world. Therefore, scripture says, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, One John chapter two, verse fifteen and sixteen. Do not love the world or the things in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now there's a new translation called the Message Bible. How many of you have seen the Message Bible? Sometimes it's good to read. You know, it makes it much more simpler and you see another perspective. The Message Bible says it this way. It says, Don't love the world's ways. Wanting your own way. Wanting everything for yourself. Wanting to appear important. Has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. How does that sound? Sounds familiar. These are words which God spoke 2,000 years ago. You know why? Because the world still hasn't changed. It's still relevant. The world still is this. And 1 John 2, 15 and 16 is talking about the three basic values of this world as opposed to the word. Don't love the world's ways. Wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Himself, Him. You know how you can break this verse under two headings? There are three things this world says what is important and we need to see whether we are led by that or we are led by the Word of God. The three things what the world says is one, pleasure, second, possessions, third, prestige. Pleasure is the lust of the flesh. Possessions is the lust of the eyes. And prestige is the pride of life. Pleasure is a primary value in this world. So is possessions. Prestige, that is power or position or popularity. If you ask most people, what do you want of life? They will say, I want to have fun. I want to be happy. I want to feel good. These are different ways of saying what I want is pleasure. I am led by pleasure. 
we live in a pleasure obsessed culture so everything that we hear see read is basically based on pleasure i want to feel good if we feel good do it i want to feel happy i'm not feeling happy therefore i must be losing something out because the others all look happy the second one possessions and it is often true we often fall into the category of buying things which we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we do not know it may sound funny but that's the truth we end up buying things that we do not need with money we don't have to impress people we do not know for many people self worth is based on their net worth possessions is the second value in our society after pleasure the second one is possessions and third is prestige most places image is everything we are very status conscious we want people to look up to us we want people to think we are important and successful and when that happens we have value we are very status conscious the problem is the eye of the world that is the media bombards us with these values pleasure possession prestige over and over and over and over and over again day in and day out that even christians get seduced by it and we buy into it we think like everybody else those are the ultimate values of life and the result is that for many christians their values are no different from that of an atheist or a materialist it's no different our values actually if you hear what's being said around in so many churches is the same thing what the atheist or the materialist also believes in and then suddenly he steps into time and he says this is my food my food isn't pleasure my food isn't possessions my food isn't prestige so when we started john chapter 4 we found he was tired he had walked all the way into samaria and he was tired and he didn't take a break his ministry was still continuing he had an eaten he was hungry he sent his disciples to buy food but when they came he was in hungry anymore because his hunger was fed by the thrill of a person getting saved doing the father's will and scripture says he emptied of all his glory all his possessions he was the prince of this universe the heaven was his throne and the earth was his full footstool the silver and gold in hagai he told us is mine he told us that my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills but when he came he didn't have a place to be born he was put in a watering trough wrapped with swaddling clothes you know what he said my value doesn't come from possessions he's telling us if through his very life he's sending us a message my value doesn't come from my possessions my value comes from who my father says i am and then his prestige what did he say scripture say it says he made himself of no reputation you know what the psalm say the psalm is says there was nothing in him to attract us to him it's not like what we see in the movies made he was in 6 feet 3 with blue eyes and golden hair and handsome and all that the way he came bible actually says if you looked at him you wouldn't want to talk to him you wouldn't give him a second look but there was this did his love and compassion and godliness about him all the sinners whom nobody gave a second look flocked around him yet we have eaten into this even in the ministry we have eaten into it everybody wants titles reverend most reverend right reverend wrong reverend everything you want you no know? it's all about prestige and to identify yourself to be different from the others you need a round collar okay purple colored robes crowns because we have eaten into the world and scripture says anyone who eats into this is not of the father is not of the father now let's go to the nkjv version of 1 john 2:15 and 16 we'll read the message version 
chapter 2 verse 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. It is not of the Father but it is of the We all know Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, I like the message version saying Romans 12, 2. It's not, the, you, want, you don't have the message version, so I will read it. It's beautiful. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. That sound different? We fit into the culture around so well without even thinking. Yet when we read the book of Acts, we see all of God's servants over there stuck out like sore thumbs in the culture in which they lived. They were different. They were different. You could make out they were different. Today, God is asking us, does the world make out that we are different? Because this is a new year. A new year is good to begin by working out what is that we value in life. Because what you value will ultimately decide your decisions that you make. See, they say, on an average, a normal man or woman or child today watches around 1,000 hours of TV a year. So if you live up to 65 years, that is nine and a half years of TV watching. And most Christians, most Christians go to church once a week. Many here also. And in those churches, Message definitely is not 1 hour 20 minutes. It's usually 20 minutes. So you end up with, in your entire life, you end up with four and a half year months of teaching. If you live up to 65 years, you get four and a half months of teaching and nine and a half years of TV. And you tell me, which values will you ultimately choose? That's what we were looking at last Sunday. Look at Psalm 23 and verse 3. When God leads us. And we are asking Him, Lord, take us by hand and you lead us. And we need to be very careful that we mean the words which we say right from the core of our heart. Because we do not know where He leads us. Psalm 23 verse 3 says, everybody knows, He leads me in paths of righteousness for what? For His name's sake. He leads me into paths of righteousness. That's the path He takes. He leads me into paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Righteousness doesn't come easily. There is a righteousness that is imputed into us when we believe then there is a righteousness God has to work within us. And that's where we struggle. That's where we struggle. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19 verses 4 to 6. Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. In the New Covenant, if you need to realize, I forgot the reference, we are called the Israel of God. We are called the Israel of God. And God is telling something to them whom He brought out. They were God's Israel. We are the Israel of God. There's a difference between the two. They went into a promised land. We inherit the land of promises. Theirs was a physical kingdom. Ours is a spiritual realm. So there is a difference between these two. Yet the call is the same. What he says is that, 
if you obey my voice, if you obey, he will lead us by hand if you obey his voice. Keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. And that's what God is asking us. Do we live on the word of God? Do we obey his voice? Or are we going to obey other voices? We looked last week when God leads his people. He doesn't lead you from the world straight into heaven. That I happened as far as I know only with my father. <laughs> he got saved and he died. Okay, But usually it doesn't happen that way. The children of Israel got saved from Egypt. They didn't reach the promised land overnight. Okay, And we don't understand that fact. God, for the sake of his righteousness, for the sake of his name, leads us through the desert. Did we see that last week? Why does he lead us into the desert? Because the desert is his testing ground where you and I will know what is that we value. Do we value those three things we looked in the beginning? What is that? Pleasure, possessions or prestige or we value the will of God and his righteousness. That's what Jesus meant by seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The desert will show up what is there within me. Why did I start this journey with God? And whether I am willing to change. Turn to Psalm 78 and verses 5 to 8. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Parents, please listen. Known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but his commandments. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set his heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. He's talking about the people in the wilderness. Now look at verses 17 and 18 of the same psalm. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness, in the desert. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. In the desert, when God is showing up their real inside, they are testing him and asking for the food of their fancy. Now look at verses 32 and 33. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days they consumed in futility and their years in fear. When he leads us into the desert and he feeds us his, with his word and he gives us his word, he feeds us with manna, but yet we are always asking God for things according to those three values, food of our fancy. Finally, he says, he finally consumed them in their futility and their ears in fear. Now ask, does this mirror us? Years have passed by. Years have passed by. We started following God maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But we know this is the truth about our life. We hide it from everybody, but we know our life, we are walking in futility. And when we look into the future, there is always fear. There is always fear. Because we did not learn the lesson of the desert. The lesson of the desert was to show what we were inside. Because you see, the desert is a place all our cravings will surface. Psalm 106 and verse 14. The desert will show me what I am inside. It will show up all the Egypt in me. Verse 14. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. All those cravings of the flesh that we took in, you can't help it. Nobody can help it because nobody was born again when they were born in the flesh. We have been soaking this from the time we were born into this world by the system around us. 
And then when we were born again, God starts leading us into the desert so that we will see that within us and we'll learn to hate it and replace it with God's will and His word in our lives. Scripture says, they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. What are we doing in the desert? You need to realize, desert, what's so special or different about, special different about the desert? The desert is a barren place. In the desert, you cannot survive on your own. All your worldly resources fail there. There you will learn to cry out to God and He gives you His manna. The desert, everybody in our sitting here has hit the desert one time or other. That's where all your intelligence, your money, your prestige, your popularity, your pull, everything falls. It doesn't work anymore. It could be where your marriage failed or your child doesn't listen anymore. Doesn't even get up from the bed to go to school. What can you do? Tie and take them to the school? I know children who have done it. Refuse to get up. Thrashed, beaten, everything. No going to school. And the parents have reached their dead end. They don't know what to do. You have all the money in the world, but you've got a sickness which cannot be cured with the medical help available. You slog and slog and slog and slog and slog and slog. You neither get a promotion nor a pay hike. And your boss doesn't like you. Everything, everything is stuck over there. And there you are in the desert. And you are crying out to God. God help me, help me, help me. And all he helps you with, he gives you his word. And says, now will you receive my word. And you are working for a, looking for a miracle. God says, not the miracle, my word. My word is the miracle. But we don't want manna. We want that fancy food. Look back and see what was your desert in 2009. Look back and see what was your desert in 2009. Where you came and realized, Lord... Wherever we can manage on our own, I am telling you, we will not depend upon God. So what God will do is lead us to a place, for His name's sake, to a place where we have to call upon His name. When He calls upon His name, we are looking for a miracle so that the miracle will come. We are out of the situation and we can go back to our old world. And God says, no, you are stuck there. Now this is the place I have brought you and I am going to change you here. I am going to change you here. So that you will learn now, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So when you are in the desert, be careful. Be very careful. When you are traveling through the desert, be very, very careful because things will start happening. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 to 7. Wow, when, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we do not know where he is. That seems to be true about the projector also today. God is telling us something. When you are in the desert, who is Moses for the people? They don't have a Bible. They don't have MP3s, CDs, not even a scroll. They don't have anything. Moses hasn't written the five books. There is nothing. Moses represents the word of God for them. When the word of God departs from your midst, when you stop listening to the word of God or obeying the word of God and you don't read the word of God anymore, what happens? That's what happened to the children of Israel. Moses is no longer there. The word of God is no longer there in their midst. The man who brings the word is no longer there in the midst. You have started avoiding the church. You are not listening to the word. You are not praying anymore. You are not reading your word anymore. You are not listening to the word anymore. What happens? You mean you will stop worshipping? No. You need to realize no man can stop worshipping because we were created to worship. If you don't worship God, you will worship something else. You will worship the TV or your job 
or your spouse or your children or pleasure, you will worship something because we have been created to worship. So the people said, that man is not here, so you do something, make us gods that shall go before us. They changed the focus of their worship. It's changed now. From the living God to something else. This is what happens when we stop listening to the word. When the word disappears from our focus should be as long as Moses was there, they kept on following, listening, obeying. And then one day Moses is in there. Two days Moses is in there. Three days Moses is in there. One week Moses is in there. And the people said, well, we can't stay like this. We need to worship. You see, we are worshippers. And we think that by avoiding the word of God, I can manage on my own. Nobody manages on their own. By not praying, I can manage, I'll pray next week, I'll pray. Jesus prayed and scripture says he was heard because of his obedience. He cried with tears and sounds that could not be uttered. That's what the book of Hebrews says. He kept on withdrawing himself every now and then to spend time with the father. By the time he was 12, he knew the Old Testament probably by heart. He knew that he needed it. But how do we neglect and we don't realize, subtly we have eaten into the other thing and we start changing. Because the focus now changes from God to an idol which we have created. And that idol which we have created is into which all our resources are poured into now. Because how did they do it? With earrings that were brought from there. From there. Yes. Golden earrings which were there in there. What did the people do? It's very interesting. The scripture says they took all their necklaces and bracelets. Does it say? It says they took all their earrings and then they melted the earring and they built a altar. No, they bought a golden car. What does it mean? Meaning, now they have started listening to another voice. It's the hearing that has gone. The idol they have created is from their earrings. Now they are not hearing right anymore. They are not hearing right anymore. They are hearing something else. The problem is that when we shift our focus from God into something else, we stop hearing. Even in the midst of your storm, in your problems, your eyes should be still upon God so that you hear correctly. Otherwise you will listen to the voice of the enemy who will speak to you through your problem. They created an idol over there. And how does it happen? It happens through the leadership. Okay? There is a ministry that is happening over there. Who is making all it? Who is making? It's Aaron who is making it. Who is making? It's Aaron who is making it. You need to realize. Let's come further to another portion. Then we will see what God says about what they did. Exodus chapter 32, verses 25 and 28. We'll go back to the previous portion again. Okay? Moses saw that the people were running wild or unrestrained. And that Aaron had let them get out of? What happened? Out of control. Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Now we see the leadership, the spiritual leadership has lost control. The spiritual leadership has made the people to be unrestrained which bring shame to God before his enemies. Go back to the previous verse and you will see why it is so. Bring it further down. Further down. And they, look at the form of worship. And they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat, drink and rose up to play. 
Whenever worship changes from God to something which we have created, worship will always end up as entertainment. Have you seen that? Even in churches? Whenever the focus shifts from the living God, our worship will be all about eating, drinking, that is pleasure and play, and about entertainment. And most churches, many churches end up like that. It's all about fun. It's now we are worshipping ourselves. We are no longer worshipping God. We are worshipping ourselves. We go to church to have a good time. That's what we mean by worship. And we don't realize we are doing exactly what the children of Israel did. They ate, they drank, and they sat down to play. And then something. Go back to the next one, which we looked at earlier. Exodus 32, 25. It is the leadership which has allowed this to happen. Whenever the leadership stands there strong and speaks the word of God and the word of God alone, this will not happen. If Aaron had stood there and took his position and stood there, this wouldn't have happened. Why was it that Aaron could not do that? When Moses could. Moses could do that because he came into the ministry through the fire, the burning bush. He had been called out of fire. But when you have a ministry which was never called out of fire, they will allow the people to lose all restraint. You need to be careful. You need to be very careful. There is a ministry that never came out of an encounter with God at the burning bush. And there is a ministry that has come out of the encounter of God at the burning bush. And when that ministry happens, there will be always restraint. The focus will be always on God. And there is no shame to God's name among his enemies. But when that doesn't happen, the enemies mock at God. And what does the man of God do? What does the man of God do? Moses comes. What does it say? And then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp. What does scripture say? He did not enter the camp. He doesn't enter the camp. He stands at the entrance of the camp. Because Moses represents God for them. He is the voice of God. When there is sin in the camp and all restraint has gone, all holiness has gone, all order has gone out, God doesn't enter the camp. He stands outside. And he stands outside and he calls people to come to him. Is that any different in the New Testament? In the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus says to the church that's sitting there inside, I stand at the door and I knock. I'm not coming in. I'm outside. I don't come in. I'm not coming. He stands at the door and he says, All who are for God, come. The God of Israel says, Come to me. And what does it say? Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him and and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Now there is Moses standing there at the, at the entrance of the camp and says, All who are for God come to me. It's not a call to prosperity and healing. It's not a call to health and wealth as today's gospel is called. It's a call to deal with sin drastically in our lives. That is the call of God always. Deal with sin in your life if, I, if you want me to come into your camp again. Because the leadership, the spiritual leadership of Aaron has brought no conviction. Because Aaron has eaten into that idolatry. A leadership that has eaten into idolatry cannot bring the conviction of sin in the camp. And there is always the servants of God who will stand at the door and cry out, Who is for the Lord? Come to me. Who is the Lord? Come to me. And who are the ones who moved? How many tribes were there? Twelve tribes were there. Only one tribe moved. Which was the tribe that moved? The tribe of Levi. Who was Levi? Levi was the third son Jacob had through Leah. Leah had hoped 
that by giving her th- husband three sons now, Jacob would be attached to her and joined in spirit with her. Okay? You need to remember. But Jacob loves Rachel, but Rachel is not, has no children. Leah is delivered one. Leah is delivered two. The third one is Levi. By the time she gives him three sons, she thinks her husband will be now attached or joined to her in the spirit. So the word Levi means those who are attached. When the call of God comes to deal with sin within the camp, within ourselves, only those who are attached to Jesus will move. All the others will stay back. If you have not been attached or joined to Jesus, whenever you hear the call of God to deal with sin in your life, you will leave and find where wealth and prosperity is preached. And sin and conviction is never spoken about because it will offend the people. Because the leadership has eaten into the idolatry of the people. Because you have a leadership that never came through the fire or who came through the fire but has forgotten the effect of the fire that purifies. Forgotten the purpose of the call. That the purpose of the call in the New and the Old Testament is the same. You shall be for me a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. You shall be for me a royal priesthood. A holy nation, a chosen people. It's the same in both Old and New Covenant. It is the same. And what did he say? He told them, when they move towards, when he moves towards you, or you move towards Jesus, the next thing he says is, strap your sword to your side. Strap your sword to your side. You know what the sword is? Ephesians 6.17 says what the sword is. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. No. Suddenly you are given only one weapon and only one. It's not mentioned they take your spear or your bow and arrow or your hammer or your axe. Nothing is mentioned. Take your sword. It says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What is God telling us here? How do we apply? Because scripture says in Corinthians, this were all put for our sake there. Examples. What is it saying? When there is sin within me and when there is sin within the camp, God is saying, take up the word of God, always be ready to use it, in season or out of season, carry the sword of the spirit, the word of God. You should be able to carry and you should have the word of God with you. And how does this word work within us? It's interesting. It says in Romans 2.29, how this word of God works. How does this word of God work? People are nodding off. People are falling asleep. Listen. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Whose praise is not from men but from God. Something is mentioned here. This is how the sword of the spirit works. The sword of the spirit works is the word of God will show the muck in my heart. And I allow the spirit of God to cut it away. Circumcision is the cutting away of that flesh of the world within me. I use the word, the sword of the spirit and allow the spirit to cut it off. And who is that? He is a Jew who is one inwardly. A Jew is not a one who is outwardly. But suddenly the name has changed here. Now here it is called Jew. It is not called Levite. Earlier we saw Levite. The one who will move towards God are the ones who are joined. Right? A Levite. But when we come here, we have a strange name called Jew. And the problem is that whenever we hear the name Jew, we get always confused because it's an English word. It's an anglicized word. How many of you know what is a Jew called in our regional translations of the Bible? What is it called in Telugu? Yehud. In Malayalam it's Yehudan. Yehudi, a Jew, is the one who is of Judah. When we read Jew, we don't understand it. Because Jew, 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 what is this Jew? Okay. But the Jew is, the Hebrew word for Jew is Yehudi. And who is Yehudi? We'll come to that. We'll come to who is Yehudi is. Because Yehudi is the next son of Jacob. Now the thing is that here something is called circumcision. What is circumcision? 
Circumcision is the cutting away of the flesh. Why? Because if you trust the flesh, God will not work in your life. So when was circumcision instituted? Circumcision was instituted after Abraham created Ishmael. After 13 years of silence, when God again appears to Abraham, the first thing he tells him is, go and get circumcised. The next thing he tells him is, throw Ishmael out. Circumcision is the cutting away of your trust in the flesh, in your intelligence, in your prestige, in your possessions, in your fame, in all those things, cutting that away. Ishmael is the ones you have created, the acts of sin you have created by trusting in these things. Usually what we do is we reverse the order. Whenever we feel convicted, we put Ishmael away. A little time light later, Ishmael comes through the back door and says there is no circumcision taken place. He gets in quietly back again. So God says don't do that. First, circumcise your heart and then throw Ishmael out. When he comes, he finds he has no place. Ishmael represents all the works of our flesh. And for that works of flesh not to be repeated, you have to circums- allow the Spirit to circumcise your heart by the Word. This is the work of the Holy Spirit through the living Word. Shall we look at Hebrews 4, 12 to 13? Because the flesh hates this. Especially that verse 13. What does it say? For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we much give account. You can't hide from God's eyes. It's all naked and open before him. It's all. So when the word of God starts working in us, it will start bearing you and me up. Say, this is what you really are. He leads us into the desert and feeds us with manna so that I will know what I am. And when he shows me what I am, he says, forsake it. My word will sustain you. Forsake it. Are you willing to obey? No, we don't want to circumcise. We will throw Ishmael out. Lord, I am sorry, sorry, Lord. I will never do it again. That 31st British decision by first Ishmael is back. God says it doesn't work that way. We are not willing to forsake. We are not willing to forsake. We are not willing to deal with it because the flesh hates this. Hates this word. That's why people run away from the word of God. Yet the ones who have been trained by the word of God, scripture says, is fit for every righteous work. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 2.21. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any work. What does the scripture say? You look at the order first. Does it say that if a man is very useful, then he will be made holy? No, it doesn't say. He says if a man is holy, then he will be made useful. God doesn't look at your or my usefulness, how talented sorry, how talented he or she is. He doesn't look at any of those things. We think God looks at all those things. We think he looks at all those things. He doesn't look at those things. Do you think God picks talented people? God looks at your pedigree, your family background, your riches, your education. Does he look at any of those things? He doesn't look at any of those things. He will look at this. Are you ready for this cleansing? If you are ready to be cleansed from the latter, from the world, then he will be a vessel for honor. He will be a vessel for honor and sanctified and useful for the master. We need to realize many people are useful for the church. They are not useful for the master. There is a difference being useful for the master and being useful for the church. We look at everybody and say, oh, he does so much, she does so much. God says, no, it's not useful for me. It's not useful for me because he or she is not dealing with the main issue. He's not dealing with Ishmael. Heart is not circumcised. He says, that's what I'm looking for. 
If heart is circumcised, then he will be useful for the master. Because you being useful for the master is never decided by the church. It is decided by the bridegroom, by the master. Are we useful for the master? Only the master knows. And how do you know you can be useful for the master is by dealing with these issues in your life. You have to be able to deal with this. We looked at the fact. Let's go back to Romans 2.29. Now it is interesting what God speaks through His Spirit there. But He is a Jew who is one inwardly and allows the circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. If you allow the Spirit of God to circumcise your heart of all that is flesh, all that is of the world, you are called a Yehudi. You are called what? You are called a Yehudi. Now let me tell you what it means. Now Judah is the fourth son of Jacob, the one who comes after Levi. When you are joined together... Joined together, Levi is joined together, the next one who comes will be a Judah. What is Judah means? Judah is a word in Hebrew coined by Leah. It's her own word. It's a combination of two words. One means praise, the other means God. Judah means praise God. And Judah, if I'm right, is only one of those very rare names in Hebrew, in which, if you understand uh, Hebrew thing, uh, Hebrew names, you will see that what they call the tetragrammaton. That is the four unspokable letters. If you put it together, becomes the name of God. Judah has that four letters. That's why Jesus will come from the tribe of Judah. Because in Judah is the name of God. Did you see it? And that's why the very holiness of the name of Judah attests to its importance as an alternate name for Israelites, which it replaces. Now, read that word slowly. Let the meaning sink in. What is it saying? No, a man is a Jew, a Yehudi, if he is one inwardly, and circumcision of the heart is by the spirit, not by the written word, code, such a man's praise is not from men, but from... Did you get the message? When you allow the spirit to circumcise your heart, now you are a Yehudi, not only one who praises God and brings praises to God, but over and above that, that man's praise is from God. That's a Yehudi. It's not that you praise God, you bring praises to God, now you are praised by God. His praise is from God. That's a Yehudi. And this is the call. The call is that our eldest brother is of the tribe of Judah. And everyone born of him belongs to that tribe. One whose praise is from God. You need to understand purpose. If you don't understand purpose, we will fight again everything God is doing actually in our life. Because he is the one who is leading each one of you, us sitting here to the desert. So that he can make us into a Yehudi. So the call goes out to everybody in the camp. Few will separate themselves from the rest and move towards Jesus. Very few will separate themselves and move towards Jesus. This is the problem that we face. Over and over again when the call comes, we do not respond. Because we look at the call and we realize, oh, I am not willing to pay that price. Because what is the response? Hebrew Exodus 32:27. 20, 32, 27. What was that Moses said? You need to realize. He said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other. He's saying, do one thing. Go through the camp. Go through it carefully from one end to the other. Back and forth. And kill whom? Kill brother Every man his companion, every man his neighbor. I'm sorry, you're not killing strangers here today. You're killing things and people who are very close to your heart. It is painful. It's a very, very tough call. Very, very tough call. Because the ones they 
we are called to kill our things or relationships to which we are very close and comfortable with. And people know what the call of God is, so they back off. Because we love them. We love those habits in our life. We are very comfortable with those habits. And God says, you need to go through your camp, heart, back and forth, and kill all those of the world whom you call your brother, your companion, your neighbor. We are not talking about people here in the new covenant. Sometimes it can be a relationship, not killing a person, but killing a relationship. It's a tough call. It's a very, very tough call. Do you think after killing those 3,000 people, they became very popular? Do you think the rest of the camp was very happy because somebody lost a brother or an uncle or a father because of them? Meaning, if you respond to the call of Jesus, the actual response of call to become a Yehudi, you will not be very popular even in the church. You offend a lot of people. You become an offense to a lot of people. It's a tough call. It may even bring scorn, shame, even violence. But it is the ultimate call of God from the beginning. From the beginning, God has been calling, come to me, come to me. Along with that, leave the world, leave the world. The call has never changed. Do you think the call has ever changed? Genesis 12.1 This is the call from the beginning. What did God say? Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people and your fathers. What did he say? Kill figuratively your brother, your friend and neighbor. What did Abraham do? He obeyed. Did he see any of them after that day? No. As far as he's concerned, they were dead for him. He never saw them again. The call is the same. What did he tell the Levites? Go kill brother, friend, companion. And what does Abraham is told? The same thing. Leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I'm saying until you do this, you will never experience the land to which God is taking us. Genesis 24, 6. And a man who obeyed that call makes the decision for the next generation, for his son. But Abraham said to Elias, Beware that you do not take my son back there. My son has the same call on his life. Don't take my son back. He is dead to his friend, father's friend, his father's neighbor and his father's companion. Did Isaac disagree with his father? He was 40 years old. Did he disagree? He did not. Genesis 31, 3. When you come to the third generation, a man has gone back, running in fear. When you are in fear, you will run back to the world. When you run back to the world, what happens when God appears to you again? Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers, to your family, and I will be with you. You ran into the world because of fear. Now go back where you should be. Go back there. You cannot live among them. You are dead to them. Go back. Genesis 50, 24 and 25. Though Joseph died in Egypt, the final words, almost final words in the book of Genesis, when Joseph dies in Egypt, his dying words were that his people would go back to their land. What does he say? And Joseph said to his brethren, and I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to you, Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. Then Jacob took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and when he does, you do one thing, please carry up my bones from here. Even my bones do not belong to this world. Carry my bones back to the promised land. Okay, They had a physical land. We have a spiritual land. We do not belong to this world. We belong to another land. As long as we tap into the patterns and the methods of this world, we will be always separated from God. And that's what God is asking and that's what God was asking them. Are you willing to leave Egypt or kill all that is of Egypt in us? It's not leaving Egypt that is so difficult for Christians. It is killing Egypt in us like them. It is so difficult. So God leads us into the desert where you cannot survive on your own. Some area in your life you have responded to the word of God. You have no choice but to respond to the word of God or be destroyed. Or end up your life in futility as we saw. Abraham reached Canaan. Any choices we have to make? Abraham reached Canaan. And as soon as he reached Canaan, a little later, scripture says, what was there? 
famine in Canaan. Why famine in Canaan? To see what choice you will make. What is the choice you make? You have two choices you can make. Either believe in the God who promised you and brought you here. He will sustain me in the famine. Or listen to what the rest of the world says. What does the rest of the world say? There is food in Egypt. Egypt is fertile. Plenty of food. That's what every choice we all have to make. Whenever you hit a roadblock, two choices. Either God, you tell me what to do. Whatever God tells you to do doesn't sound sensible. Because he says stay there. The world says move out. And moving out is easy because the whole crowd is moving out. Satyam fiasco started, everybody was putting in their papers. God tells you, stay there. Are you sure, Lord, you are telling me to stay? This company could crash any time. No, you stay there. But everybody is moving out. Well, you stay there. Don't look at them. You stay there. It is difficult for Abraham to stay there. Because everybody was moving out. And what did he do? He chose the way of Egypt. He moved into Egypt. Trusting and obeying God is a walk of faith. When faith goes out, what comes in? It's not an empty space is left there. Fear comes in, worry comes in, anxiety and all the relatives keep coming together if you don't deal it with fast. What are the relatives? Depression, discouragement, bitterness, hatred, self-pity, suicidal thoughts, thoughts and a whole lot of it. They all come together when you step out of God's will into Egypt. Now, you are still a believer. Why? Because I left Haran for God. So you are a believer. But what is happening? You are trying to serve God in faith and the Pharaoh in fear. Where are you trying to serve? I am, I am, who are you Abraham? Well, I am Yahweh's servant. But whom are you serving here? I am serving Pharaoh. How are you serving Pharaoh? By faith? No, by in fear. The problem is, it is a test. Egypt, if you move into Egypt, disobeying God, it is a test of your integrity. And that's how people lose their integrity. If you step outside of God's will and move, God's will and move into this world, you will barter what is closest to you to save your skin. He sold his wife to save his life. Sarah represents what are things which are close to your ideals and your noble things which you believed in. But when you step into the world, you start selling it. Because now it's about preserving your skin. He bartered Sarah so that he would save his skin. That's the danger. When we embrace the food of Egypt, this world, people will even barter their own spouses. That's why divorces take place. Let me tell you, that's why divorces take place. Separation takes place. Because people barter their spouses because they have embraced the food of this world. In Egypt, your heart is always divided. Why? For you know you have sold what you held dear yesterday in the promised land. And now she is in Pharaoh's palace. And you are outside. The desert, desert showed Abraham what he really was inside. God in his mercy intervenes and gets him out. So, let's pray with each one of us. When we sell our integrity because we stepped out in fear, Let's pray God intervenes and takes us out. This is the danger. This is the danger. We sell out. And then, does it stop there? No. He's showing Abraham what you really are, Abraham. You may be thinking that you have left the earth of the Chaldeans, but there is a lot of Chaldea still in your heart. You hit another desert now. You've been promised something, but whenever you look, what happens? Your wife is barren. Is there barrenness in your life? When God called you, you thought you are going to prosper? Your ministry is going to grow? Or your children are all going to be godly? Instead you face trouble at your workplace every day? You slog in day in and day out, there is no appreciation or pay hike? You minister day and night and nobody believes? Your children are so rebellious you want to change your name and call yourself Ellie and rename them Phineas and Hopni? What are you going to do? Sarah offers... Abraham, a solution. Imagine, remember, it's an Egyptian solution. For every trial you face in this life, there is an Egyptian solution, a solution of the world. Why? Here is my Egyptian maid. Not Canaanite maid. Not a maid from Haran. My Egyptian maid. Remember, Egypt solution. For all trials, there is an Egyptian solution. Ask, in 2009, did we try that shortcut? When people didn't come in 
for your meetings, pastors around the world who will listen? The pastor, did you change the message to draw the crowds? Because you didn't pay, get your pay hike, did you run down the ones who did? Or fudge the accounts? Or steal from God in your tithes? Because your children wouldn't listen. Were you tired of parenting that you thought about outsourcing their responsibility? Because the wife of a youth had lost her charm after a few children in a row, did you find comfort in the company of another? And because you didn't want to go back home, did you find comfort in your office? Hagar represents all these and more. That is Hagar, the Egyptian maid. The child of Hagar will bring some joy for a season. Then trouble will erupt. And scripture confirms it. Now you are stuck. Hagar is there. Ishmael also has been created. What do you do with Ishmael? And if you want the peace of God, God says, throw the slave woman and her child out. And it will cost you a lot of pain because you have invested in Hagar and her son. Many stop here. Many believers stop here now because they don't want Sarah anymore. They want Hagar. Meaning, all that is lawful in God's sight is quietly put away. And all that is unlawful in God's sight is made acceptable. Because the society will accept it. They have no problems with that. But do you have the conviction of Abraham to do what is right in God's eyes? Even if it breaks your heart and send Hagar and her child away. It may expose you to ridicule, scorn and even hatred of the Egyptians. But do you want victory in the desert in 2010 is the question God is asking. Let's go to Exodus, back to Exodus 32 and verse 29. What does God say there? Moses said, Consecrate yourself today that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man who has opposed his son and his brother. Now what is God saying to the Levites? Because you raised your hand for my name's sake against all that was in you of the world which was close to you, but for my sake you raised your hand against your son and your brother, I am going to bestow a blessing upon you. From today onwards, you shall be my priests. That's the blessing God gives. You shall be truly called my servants. You are serving me now. You are not serving the world anymore. You are my servants. We are called to serve him. It doesn't come easily. Church, it doesn't come easily. It doesn't come easily. This is the call of God in our lives. We can be God's people. We can be God's servants. To be God's servants, this is the call. We have to get up from that excuse we have made, sat on it for many, many years. Very comfortable there. Very, very comfortable. All those were excuses because we were not willing to deal with the real issues. That's why Jesus walked into that pool. He searched and he found one man over there and he said, do you want to get well? How many years has he been sitting like that? 38 years. How many years did the children of Israel wander? 38 years. Two years to reach Kadesh Barnea, final rebellion, after that 38 years. How many years did they wander? 38 years. That man symbolized Israel and every child of God who has been walking, wandering in the desert because of disobedience. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? What is question to ask? Because the truth God knows is that many people don't want to get well because they love their mat. Sitting on a mat. They love that mat. All those mats are excuses we make before God. He says, do you really want to get well? If it had been a Tamil pastor, he would have said, Thailam he would have said, let us see if we can work some healing on him. Healing doesn't come in the beginning. You need, you need deliverance from situations. You need to be, let go and say, let God be God. Did God say that? He didn't say. What did he say? Take up your mat and walk. Those are all your excuses. Now when you walk over there, people will realize all these were what? Just excuses. 
who are sitting on this all these years, let them see. They have no power to control me anymore. I am in charge. But the religious leaders won't like you carrying all that because then where will their tithes and offerings come from if you are free? They want you to go back to them over and over again for prayer and remain in your misery. So the Pharisee says, how can you carry that mat and walk? But the man doesn't know who healed him. He said, the man who healed me told me to carry it and walk. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't sit on your problems. Your problems, you overcome it. Or you can waste your life sitting around. No excuses, please, he says. No excuses, please. Either your excuses are valid or the power of God is true. You can choose between the two this year. God is able, is more than able. Another year he has given us. Another year he has given us. You can either go after possessions, prestige or pleasure. Or you can be tired, weary, hungry, doing the will of God. And says it sustains me. His word sustains me. Even if I'm alone, I'm going to be alone. I'll be stand up and be counted. I'll be called what? Not enough I'm called a Levite, joined with Christ. I want to be called a Yehudi whose praise is from God. I'm not in, I don't want man's praise. Paul says, I do not preach to man. I preach to him because I want praise from God. We are satisfied with praise from God, from man. That's why we spend most of our money on unnecessary things. We don't want to be ourselves. The things which God taught me the hard way, don't waste your money. Because when I first worked for two years and I came back to India, I had a bank full of money which I blew off in six months. It's all over. Finished. Girlfriend, money. Never got into public transport. Always cabs. Every restaurant in Hyderabad, six months later, the account was empty. He said, I will teach you the hard way. I'll teach you the hard way. You will learn to trust me. You will learn to spend where I tell you to spend. You believe me, you will not lack. But it's not about fame. It's not about prestige. It's not about a name. If you wait for my time, I'll keep you moving in my time. And you will eat the best of the land. And I'm telling you, I know. You are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. I'm telling you, the difference is that it, you, you need to have like a Teflon coating inside. Whatever God gives you shouldn't stick inside, it should just be outside of you. In my lane, I probably live in the largest apartment. You saw Some of you saw the apartment, the largest apartment. Yet you know what's common between me and the people who live there? There's nothing common. The only thing I have common is with the watchmen of every other apartment. We all sweep in the morning together. And they haven't figured me out. They say, when people visit this guy, the whole lane is chock full of cars. Yet he goes with two children on a scooter and sweeps his own yard. And all the watchmen are my friends. You know why? Because he told me you will do it. So that this doesn't stick to your head. Stay there. That's what you are. Stay there. That's what you are. Doesn't stick. Doesn't destroy you. That you will never ask anybody, anybody for anything. Be satisfied with what I give you. I will give it to you. And I will multiply. Some of you who came home so. My brothers, my brother has come last week and I never asked him for a thing did I ask him. I never asked him for a thing. I never asked him for a thing. Yet my phone was actually breaking apart. And he brought me four phones, including a Blackberry. I don't even know how to use it, and my daughter is asking for it. <laughs> he looked at my laptop and said, you're using this laptop, why didn't you tell me? I said, it's okay, I don't tell. Can I buy you one? What do you want, Dell? Sony Wire? I said, it's okay. It's okay. You know why? Because he's still flesh. He doesn't believe. He doesn't believe. You don't ask. You don't ask. You know? Exactly what God told me. Remember, he's the father of faith. I have lifted my hand unto God. I will not take even a thong from your sandal. Don't ask. Flesh and blood. He will take care. If he doesn't take care, you be comfortable where God has placed you. If you are content where God has placed you, he says, I will deny you no good thing. No good thing. Don't have to run after. 
Can we live a debt-free life? Have more than enough to give away? Have a family such so large who loves you? Wherever you go, he will give you homes. You don't have to bury because he says the earth and its fullness belongs to him. And he's got a very large family who's called by his name. But you have to start taking tough decisions in the desert. And the simple decisions begin on every Sunday, the first day of the week. Lord, and I have to tell you some of you people, family people, if the rest of the family is, I've told my daughter, if you delay me, I'll leave you one day at home and I'll go to church. You will have to catch an auto and come on your own. Lock and come. I'll give you a chance a couple of Sundays, but after that you come on your own. I will not let you delay me. Some of you need to do that. If the other part of the family is delaying you, leave them and come. You can decide whether your wife or your husband or your child is bigger than God. Because he says, I will be here at nine. And those who are not attending the Bible study, for you, God says, I'll be here at 10. And if you can't be faithful in that small little thing, maybe some of you need to change. You ask God and say, Lord, I'm willing to change my job if they don't allow me to worship you. Are you ready? Are you ready? I know of a man who had a 40,000 earning job and moved to Hyderabad for a 5,000 earning job because God told him that's where you need to be. He quit and came and worked for two years for a 5,000 rupee job. Used all his savings to pay his rent. And then God's appointed time, God moved him to an 80,000 rupee job. But he was obedient. That's how you learn your obedience. His hand can never be limited if you obey. It's not easy. It's tough. But... When you walk those tough ways, you will realize the hand of God. That's why he leads you and me into the desert. He leads you and me into the desert. When he leads me into a leads desert, it is so that we will walk in his righteousness. And in his righteousness, what does David say? He says, he spreads for me a table in the presence of my enemies. I'll spread a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And your cup will run over. It will run over. I said last Sunday, right? Testimony. Remember our, our church testimony? We began with nothing, church. We began with nothing. We had nothing. Not a hall. Not a pie. Not an instrument. Not a chair. We had nothing. But a man's wealth or a church's wealth is not counted by the abundance of his possessions, but what you have given away. Always remember, in God's sight, your wealth is always counted what you have given away, not by how you kept back. That's why God is a rich God who says, your 100% belongs to me, I give you 90%. You think the 100% belongs to us, we are giving him 10%. He says, you got it wrong, the earth, the gold, the silver are mine. The power to earn wealth which I gave you is mine. So, I give you 90, I am asking you to give me 10 Count it. Look at it. It's a new year. Start on a strong note on faith by saying, Lord, I'm going to make tough commitments. I'm, going to, I'm enough wandering around. I'm enough wandering. 38 years are over of mine in the desert. I want to move in. That's why God looked at Caleb and said, this man had a different spirit in him. This man had a different spirit in him. And God ill raise up. I'm telling you prophetically, the greatest generation ever in church history, in human history, will be the overcomers from the last generation. Because if you can overcome it in the midst of all these temptations, trials and pressure, you will be the greatest. Because no generation has ever faced pressure of pleasure, of possessions and of prestige like we have. No generation has ever faced. But if you can overcome here, now... You will see Jesus what he meant. The last will become the first. And there are prophetically people say about uh, the generation mentions figuratively in the Psalms about being the ones who will actually the rulers. And they say they come from the last generation. Anyone sitting here can be one of that. If you choose. But if you run after these three things, what are the three things? Remember? Pleasure. You are telling us this morning, O oh God, that if we confess and we forsake the sins of 2009, we are safe. 
and secure from the enemy's plan. And no weapon that is formed against us this year will stand a God. Because the blood proclaims that we are holy and righteous before you, O God. Only the blood can give that right, O Master. We cannot earn it by our positions, by our hard work, by our our name, our reputation, we can never earn that right to God. It is freely given to those who come to the blood of Jesus. Who will forsake, repent, and the blood washes us clean and proclaims holy and righteous. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, as we begin this new year and we go through this month, through the months to come, Father, we pray, Lord, each one of us will hear the call of God. As you told John, the apostle in the island of Patmos, come up hither. Father, I pray your people will obey that call to come up higher to you and leave behind all those things which we've been holding on to that's been hampering our walk with you, O God. Little things and big things. Father, I pray this year your people will separate themselves. As you told the Levites, consecrate yourself that I might bestow a blessing upon you. And that blessing was to be the priest of the living God. Father, I pray that will be our privilege this year to be priests of the living God. And we'll seek your word, we'll devour your word, and we'll walk in the word, listening to your voice, O Master. And in our weaknesses, your grace will be sufficient. And your grace will empower us to keep your word, O Master. For Father, it's all your work from the beginning till the end. Help us to surrender daily to the sword of the Spirit as he circumcises our heart to us, that, O oh God, in our heart, only Christ and Christ alone is enthroned. Thank you, Father. We praise you, we worship you, God. We give you all the glory and the honor, for it's yours and yours alone. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. For all our sermons and Bible study messages, please visit us online at www.gracetabernaclehype.org. I repeat, www.gracetabernaclehype.org.